Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, Before we do get started, I do want to encourage you, as you're making your travel plans, remember johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate, so you can name your own price on hotels, rental cars, airline tickets, and even more, uh, just like going through Priceline.com. But part of the purchase price goes to support the great detectives of old-time radio at no additional cost to you. Well, today we're going to bring you the 600th broadcast of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Uh, This was not marked with any pomp or circumstance. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service uh, version, but I doubt it was uh, celebrated. Most of these milestones weren't, particularly with a big split in the episodes and some uh, episodes being dailies. But at any rate, here now from August 24th, 1958, is the noxious needle matter. I wish you to investigate the death of one of our clients. All right. Have you ever heard of J. Lamont Schofield? Uh, the theatrical producer? Yeah. Sure. World famous for the beautiful girls he employed in his reviews. Of yeah, Broadway. well, well do I remember. Now, what about him? Well, if you've seen the papers, you know that he died yesterday. No, I didn't know. As natural causes, the medical report stated. But you think otherwise? I do. Why, sir? Because of the, uh, the beneficiary named in his three-quarter of a million dollar insurance policy. Three-quarters of a million? Yes. So I think you'd better come over here and see me. Yeah, Mr. Westbury. I think I'd better. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense accounts submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the noxious needle matter. Expense account item 185 cents for a taxi to the office of Worldwide. When I got there, I had to go through a receptionist and two secretaries to get into Mr. Waldo R. Westbury's private office. Please sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. Well? Now, uh, here's the policy I mentioned. Providing $750,000 insurance on the life of the late J. Lamont Schofield. That's a lot of money, Mr. Westbury. Incidentally, was he married? Schofield? Surrounded by beautiful women all his professional life? No. Then who was his beneficiary? This policy has been in effect only 13 years, but... Look here. Look at these writers. Changing the beneficiaries. Hmm. Goldie Laferne. <laughs> Sounds like a burlesque queen. She was. After his money, of course. Toodles, Tempest. Wow. Oh, horrid name. Baby Boodles Baker. Oh, that's worse. Bubbles Jones. Holy smoke. Pepper Caprice Carstairs. Cupcake Delon. And... Hey, what's this doing here? Mary T. Smith. She is the present beneficiary. Well, that's quite a come down from all those babes. Uh, Mr. Dollar, the initial T stands for torso. The stage uh, designation she used. Oh, and you think she bumped him off to collect the insurance? Bumped him? Oh, yes, I do. But if a medical report says the old man died of natural causes... At the time of his death, Mary Smith, Mary T. Smith was his private nurse, responsible for his care, the medication he received, and so forth. Ah, I see. I'm glad you do. Because if you can prove she murdered him... In spite of the doctor's report? Yes. You can save our company a great deal of money. 
I don't often say this, Mr. Dollar, but in view of the amount involved, there'll be no questioning any necessary items on your expense account, no matter how high. Necessary items? Well, surely you wouldn't think of listing any unnecessary expenditures? Dream on, Mr. Waterbury. Hmm? Well, what? Nothing. You say that Schofield died yesterday. Yes, today afternoon. Where? At his home in Cranford, New Jersey. Do you know who his doctor was? Yes, Dr. Leonard Foote. Good. Now, I wonder where this nurse is. Anybody keeping an eye on her? Yes, you'll find her there at Scofield's home. Obviously, she's a very smart woman. You mean smart enough not to run? Well, I'd put it the other way, Mr. Dollar. Smart enough to have made him name her in his policy and to stay around to collect. Do you know anything about her? Only that she was a showgirl before making this pretense of being a nurse. Yeah, but if a doctor was willing to have her take care of him, you know anything about him? Frankly, no. Then I have a sneaking suspicion I'd better pay him a visit. <laughs> Item two, four dollars and fifteen cents for another taxi, then a train down to New York. At Grand Central, I ran up item three, fifty bucks deposit on the drive your own car. Item four, fifty cents to get through the tunnel to Jersey. From the city of Elizabeth, I headed west on Route 28 to the pretty little town of Cranford. Then directly to the combination home and office of Dr. Leonard Foote, where I cooled my heels for a half hour in the reception room. Bye, Doctor. Goodbye, Jimmy. Come in, please, Mr. Dollar. I'm sorry to have had to keep you waiting. Oh, that's uh, quite all right, Doctor. But if little Jimmy Sayer doesn't stop eating green apples, he's going to have worse than a tummy ache. Your company called that you'd be here because of the death of Jay Lamont Schofield. Sit down. I'll be very honest with you, Doctor. His insurance company thinks your opinion of death from natural causes might be wrong. My tentative opinion, Mr. Dollar. Lamont Schofield suffered from, well, rather than bore you with a lot of medical terminology, let's say he had a heart condition, one that required that he take it easy and, of course, medication. What kind of medication? Digitalis, for the most part, to limit the frequency of his heart contractions. And more recently, he's been receiving intravenous injections of sedilinib. His nurse gave him the injections? Yes, under my orders. I, uh, understand she's an old burlesque queen. Well, some years ago, he starred Mary in one of his Broadway productions. Uh, it was a flop. But shouldn't he have had a regular, licensed, registered nurse? She was a registered nurse, Mr. Dollar. Is she still a good looker? Over the years, Lamont kept himself pretty well surrounded by, uh... Well, some of them were very pretty girls. Well, not this Mary, so I doubt they were all after his money. Including Mary. Well, Mr. Dollar, I told you my tentative opinion was death due to natural causes. So the papers reported. But now let's face it, Doctor. If she hastened his demise by, say, an overdose of one of those injections... I learned. And while morning. acting under your orders by using something that you put into her hands... Now, just a it minute, It could though. look pretty bad for you, too, couldn't it? Are you trying to I'm imply... I'm just stating facts. ...imply that I might have conspired with that girl to bring about the death of Such one of my... Such a thing is always a possibility now, isn't it? Well? Are such tactics usually part of an investigation like this? Why not? If you were guilty, if I could get you riled up, catch you off your guard. I see. I don't like you, Dollar. I shall expect your apology. I'll see. As I started to say before you interrupted me, I learned just this morning from Monty's attorney that Mary Smith is the heir to Lamont's estate and the beneficiary to his insurance policy. You didn't know this before? I did not. Nonetheless, as a result, I have ordered his body held at the coroner's office. Oh? Yes, so that a complete autopsy can be made. Oh, I see. I'm sorry, Doctor. Would you like a towel, Mr. Dollar? Towel? To wipe the egg off your face? Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Sometimes we may wonder why a football team doesn't quit playing and walk off the field when it finds itself 50 points behind with only a few minutes of play to go. What is that indomitable spirit that fills men with hope and keeps them going in spite of terrific odds, keeps them going just to play the game according to the rules, just to get the job done as well as they know how? 
This kind of spirit pervaded the feelings of heavy bomber crews of the 9th Air Force on that day of glory, August 1st, 1943, the day of one of the most secretly planned surprise bombing missions of World War II. The day of the low-level attack on the Romanian oil refineries at Ploesti. More than 170 B-24 heavily loaded bombers took off in a swirl of red dust from Benghazi, Libya, to bomb a highly defended priority target. The element of surprise in the low-level attack was to be one of their greatest weapons. But things went wrong from the start. Three planes exploded during takeoff operations. Eleven more aborted due to engine trouble. Of those that reached the target area, less than one-third returned to home base. The leaders of the mission encountered navigation difficulties and difficulty in identifying the specific targets. And due to the loss of that elemental hope, surprise, they also encountered devastating enemy firepower from flak and fighters. The mission was partially successful but a horrifying experience. Five medals of honor were awarded to the heroes of the Ploesti Raid for valorous action above and beyond the call of duty. At any time, the men would have been justified in turning back, but they had a code of conduct that made them want to see the unequal game through to the end. It was a job that had to be done. A charge of the light brigade in the air as they flew down the valley of death to glory. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Noxious Needle Matter. Yes, Mr. Dollar, as soon as I learned that this ex-showgirl was to be Lamont Schofield's sole heir... Well, I realize the same possibility that I'm sure you must be considering. That she may have helped him over the hill. Precisely. I know all things being equal, Doctor. You, do you feel that he should have lived on a while? Well, where a bad heart is concerned, one can never be certain, of course. But knowing his desire to live, his willingness to adhere to my instructions, take care of himself, plus the medication I provided... Medication given by this Mary Smith. Yes, I would have wagered he could live on for 10 or 15 years. Why don't we know the results of the autopsy? A toxicologist by the name of Stanley has been called in at my request. It may take several days. I see. Meantime, then, I'm going to see this Mary Smith. Uh, incidentally, the police found no sign of any poison, of anything that might have been used to cause Lamont's death. You mean the police have been in on this? Yes, they've been very thorough. Then why the autopsy on a toxicologist? Because the least detectable means would have been an overdose of medication. I see. Now, Doctor... I've really told you all I can, Mr. Dollar. But why don't you go along and see Mary Smith? Yeah, well, I intend to, but now tell me... Call me if you need me after you've talked with her. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. When that autopsy report comes through... I'll let you know. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> The home of the late J. Lamont Schofield turned out to be a small place on 3rd Street, nestled in among some fine old oak trees that gave it a quiet sort of isolation. A far cry from the bright lights of Broadway. Apparently, he had taken his doctor's advice. I wondered about the ex-Burley Queen turned nurse who'd managed to save enough of her looks and figure to charm him into leaving her his all. Matter of fact, I've often wondered how a lot of those old war horses... Yes? Oh, how do you do? Uh, that is, I... I'm looking for a Miss Mary Smith. I'm Mary Smith. Oh, Warhorse. Believe me, I guess wrong. Because when it comes to describing Mary Smith... Well, there's only one word that does justice to her. Wow, I... She was in her mid-twenties, tall, blonde, and beautiful. Yeah, she looked as though she'd just stepped out of Charles of the Ritz. And I say it again. Wow. <laughs> Don't just stand there. Who are you? Oh, uh, Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, gee, I've heard of you, Johnny. You know something? You're even better looking than I thought you'd be. 
Won't you come in? Yeah, thanks. But why did he send you here? There's no question about my getting Monty's insurance, is there? Well, it's just that the company always demands a routine investigation where such a large sum is involved. No kidding. Sit down, huh? Yeah, thanks. Can I pour you a drink? No, no, thank you. Oh, come on. Have one with me. It's so glum around here since Marty died. And nobody here except a lot of crepe hangers. A little one? No, um, okay. Okay. Y'all can't just sit around and look grief-stricken. Have you been grief-stricken, Mary? You want the truth? No. What good was it doing Marty living that way? Not able to tear around like he used to, putting on shows and having a big time? Here, Johnny, here's to life, love, and the pursuit of happiness. Scroll. Oh, that's better. I really needed that. You got a lot of money, Johnny. I? <laughs> well, no, not much. No, I never had any either, but I will now. Plenty. Then you know you're Lamont Schofield's heir. Oh, you got your life, I do. I had to work for it long enough, feeding him and... Nursing him, taking care of him, and fending off a lot of old biddies from the old days who were trying to get their claws on him. But you managed to get your claws on him. Well, wouldn't you have done the same thing? See? Not paid off. Took him a long time to die, though, didn't it? Johnny, I've been on 24-hour duty here for two years, for two solid years, and I make no bones about it. There were times when I thought he was going to live forever. There were times when I wished I could help him out of this world. So finally you did? Johnny. Here, let me freshen your drink. Mary, I think you killed Lamont Schofield. Well, I'd like to see you prove. I don't think I'll have to. Oh? Why not? Isn't that why you came here? No, I came to make sure you don't try to slip out when the autopsy report comes out. Uh, auto- oh. Does that scare you? No, of course not. Let's face it, Mary. When somebody shows an attitude like yours, it means you're completely innocent sure. or guilty as the devil. But at least it makes it very confusing for you and for the police, doesn't it? So you're having a ball. Of course I am. Listen, Johnny, I don't blame you a bit for thinking I killed Marty. I wanted him dead. I wanted his money. Did what I had to do to get it, and then I'm going to get it. Yeah, did what you had to do. So if the autopsy shows he was given poison... Don't worry, it won't. Or that he was given an overdose of digitalis or whatever it is he was getting. Now, that would be stupid with nobody here but me. Nobody but you? There hadn't been a soul in this house except me for over a week. Since the last time Dr. Foote came to see You're him. sure of that? Well, of course I am. Then if somebody did kill him, it would have to be you. Yes. Nobody else. Yes, sure. Remember that, Mary. Would you like me to put it down on paper for you and sign it? Yeah, would you? Sure. I'll do anything, Johnny. If it'll confuse you. All right. Then start writing. Why not? Now, let's see. I, Mary T. Smith. Is that all right for a start? Oh, excuse me. No, 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 no. Keep keep writing. I'll take it. All right. I, Mary T. Smith. Oh. Oh, yes, Doctor. Yes. Oh. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. Not even the possibility of too much of... I see. And you're sure? Of course he's sure. Okay, Doctor. He disappointed, John? Because they found no poison? No overdose of fidelity? I guess you know the answer, don't you? <laughs> of course I do. The autopsy showed nothing. You can't build a case out of thin air. So here. Here's your little paper all signed and sealed. Johnny, I don't want it, and you said you did. You're far too smug, Mary. I have a right to be. You're barking up the wrong tree. You cannot build a case on nothing but thin air. Yeah, yeah, I know. So what do I do, Johnny? Just sit here and wait until your company pays you the money? Can't build a case. Until the estate is settled, or can I collect... Yeah. Yeah, Mary, you stay right here. And thanks for saying that. Huh? Johnny, what do you mean? Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Times have changed, and so has the man. 
In the year 1775, a patriotic, enterprising American by the name of David Bushnell invented a strange craft. It was constructed of two oak beams resembling two platters clapped together and propelled by a water screw attached to a hand-operated crank. Another water screw regulated the depth to which the craft could descend. This was the American Turtle, the first United States submarine. 179 years later, 1954, the United States came up with another first. This time, however, it was a 3,000-ton, $55 million vessel powered by an atomic reactor. It was the Nautilus, the world's first atom-powered submarine. And where the American Turtle was a one-man operation dependent on courage and brawn, the Nautilus is a complicated network of advanced electronics, the operation of which is dependent upon a team of highly trained, skilled Navy men who know their jobs and do them well. Yes, times have changed, and so has the man. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Noxious Needle Matter. <laughs> Expense account item 4370 for a phone call to my own doctor back in Hartford. A man very much interested in criminal medicine. I asked him about a couple of ideas I suddenly had for committing the so-called perfect crime. I got some enlightening answers. Then hung up and drove into the coroner's office. I told you over the phone, Dollar, we found nothing to indicate... Yes, excuse me, Dr. Foot. You're the toxicologist who did the autopsy, Dr. Stanley? Yes, Mr. Dollar. And as uh, Dr. Foot told me... Listen, could Lamont Schofield possibly have died of an embo... of an embolus in the brain, maybe? Well, yes, I suppose so. Can you find out by further examination? Well, of course. Then go to it. What is this, Dollar? Are you trying to play doctor now? I told you in the beginning I don't like your tactics. I don't like Right, Mr. Dollar, an embolus in the brain. Well, what should have led you to suspect... All right, now listen. I don't know where the equipment is that Mary Smith used to give the medication to Mr. Schofield. I have it all here, Dollar. The remains of the bottle of sedilinib that I prescribed, the hypodermic with which she administered, all in this kit. Which needle did you use, Dr. Foot? The small one, of course. He only received two cc's. One of these others, this big one. Simply part of the set. Only the smaller one ever had anything in it. We checked. The others never contained anything more substantial than air. That's right. Air. What? Mr. Dollar. Yes, Dr. Stanley. 30, 40, 50 cc's of air, plain air, injected into a vein? Yes, of course it would cause an embolus. And if you were to find traces, microscopic traces of the flesh of Lamont Schofield in that hypo that contained nothing but air. Yes, yes, of course. I'll go to work on it immediately. If he does find traces of dermal tissue on that needle, uh, I can't believe it. A case built on nothing but thin air. Yeah. And the ironic part of it is, the tip-off came from Mary T. Smith. Yes, the microscope showed that needle had been used on Jay Lamont Schofield recently. Pretty slim evidence, I know. But when Mary was faced with it, well, I'm still not quite sure why. Maybe we scared her. But she broke down and confessed the murder. If she'd been wrong, sometimes you can build a case on nothing but thin air. Expense account total, $61.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Bartlett Robinson, Marvin Miller, and Junius Matthews. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking.
This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surface series. Oh, and a Madam's Wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Well, in many ways, this is, seems to be just a standard uh, criminal slips and says something that incriminates them. But what I like about this is it's not a direct slip, but it's just something that gets Johnny to thinking about what might have uh, caused this, what might have made this a murder, uh, mainly because she was acting just so uh, sure of herself that there was no way that uh, she could uh, be found out. So I really like the way this played out. It definitely was cleverly written. It almost felt in some ways, you know, if somebody sat down and said, I wonder if I could write a script where they're able to build a case out of thin air. Uh, almost a challenge, but very well met. And uh, at any rate, we'll turn now to some listener comments and feedback. And we've got three new reviews in the iTunes store. And uh, we start with... Uh, Jam, who says, this is one of my favorite podcasts to listen to before bed. This is a fantastic collection of old-time radio detective programs. Johnny Dollar cracks me up. I love this show. So does my sister. I've got everyone hooked on it. Kudos. Well, thanks so much. Uh, definitely appreciate you sharing uh, great detectives of old-time radio. And Going uh, says, a fantastic podcast. Adam really knows his stuff. My favorite is Johnny Dollar. What a fantastic actor Bob da Bailey is. Uh, he has by far the greatest emotional range of any other detective out there. I know, have no problem with Adam putting in new ads, but don't take out the old ones as they are great snapshots of the time. Well, we definitely um, won't cut out um, any ads just for the purpose of inserting... Um, new ads. That's the whole point of the bumper ads, is we r run them so they are after uh, the show. So anything that was in the show that uh, we're keeping in, we're just going to continue to keep in, and then the bumper comes between the end of the show and our commentary. And What a Mythican uh, says, I really enjoy listening to all the great detective shows that Adam shares. He does a great job on presenting the program and giving his take on them. I was so glad to find his podcast that plays only old-time uh, great detectives. This is the podcast that I download so I can enjoy them while I am in Mexico three months out of the year. Well, thanks so much. I'm glad uh, you're enjoying them. And uh, we also do have a couple just general comments in praise of Johnny Dollar uh, from our listeners posted over on uh, Facebook. Um, Johnny says, uh, this is my favorite radio show. And Angela says, hands down, the best show on radio. Well, thanks so much. Do appreciate your kind comments. That will actually do it for today. We'll be back tomorrow with Dragnet. And then next fr uh, Friday, join us for another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of 